good morning students this is the last slide, um, presentations uh, or the e lecture in the heart series and this is total of 51 slides and i will be doing in half and half so it will be in two parts uh, at uh, atherosclerosis is a condition which affect your major arteries and when this condition affects uh, the arteries of the heart then it is known as coronary artery disease coronary artery disease is number one killer of Americans and most of these deaths are from heart attacks which are caused by certain blood clots in the heart's arteries now now patients with uh, coronary artery disease um, can be asymptomatic or they can develop a stable angina or chest pain you know stable chronic angina or chest pain unstable angina and mi which is myocardial infarction they are more serious manifestations of cad and are known as acute coronary syndrome um, now for the purpose of the exam i'm not going much into detail in your acute coronary syndrome uh, regarding MI, I would like you to at least know uh, what are the, you know, the four basic treatments for anybody who's having uh, chest pain. So we'll talk about this in class. You know, you give morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin. You know, um, though that kind. That's the thing of which I'll discuss in class. Now, the American Heart Association is, estimates that 1.1 million Americans will have an MI each year, and about one-fourth of these will die in an emergency department or before reaching a hospital. Although, due to the advanced medical technology, MI has decreased, but still it remains the leading cause of death uh, in the U.S. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the pathophysiology, atherosclerosis is the major cause of CAD and it is characterized by fat deposits within the intimal layer of artery. Artery has three layers, tunica externa, outside layer, then the middle layer, tunica media, and then the inside layer, tunica intima, which is very close to the lumen of the blood vessel. So it is characterized by fatty deposits and the fatty deposits may start, you know, the injury of the arterial wall may start from outside like tunica externa, media, and slowly the fat deposits, they become heavy blocks deposits and they may reach the lumen of the arterial wall and may block the blood flow completely. Uh, endothelial injury and inflammation play a major role in development of uh, coronary artery disease. In this slide, then there are stages of atherosclerosis. Now, looking at so much of you know uh, explanation and so much of you know words over here, uh, don't you don't need to worry. It's just telling you the progression. You know how a small, simple fatty streak, it, uh, it, uh, you know, through development of many years, it became a complicated lesion in hand, and uh, it became so dangerous that it had a capacity of stopping the body's blood circulation in the heart, and the patient has heart attack. So what happened is uh, now the endothelium or the inner lining of the vessel wall, it is normally non-reactive to platelets, WBC, as well as any other fibrinolytic or, and any other complementary factors. But if the patient or if any human being, they use tobacco, and they have high hyperlipidemia or they have hypertension or they have diabetes or they have hyperhomocysteinemia and infection all this will cause a local inflammatory response within these arterial walls and cad is a progressive disease that develops over many years um, 
in the beginning stages it may not be symptomatic at all and when it becomes symptomatic the disease process is usually very well advanced the stages of development in atherosclerosis are fatty streak fibrous block and complicated lesion now i did make a presentation on uh, atherosclerosis separately but here we are trying to learn how atherosclerosis is the major cause of coronary artery disease um, in the beginning stages when there has been uh, first there has been a chronic endothelial injury due to all these causes hypertension tobacco use etc when all these the injury has happened to the lining of the vessel wall then what happens the second stage is they will appear a fatty streak now the, the fat will accumulate and it will migrate into smooth muscle cells of the arterial wall now these fatty streaks are actually they are small um streaks of fat within the smooth muscle cells and they have a yellow tinge to it and they are filled with lipid so they are filled with li lipid filled they are lipid filled smooth muscle in the arterial wall and uh, the fatty streaks it says can be seen in a human being by age 15 and after a decade or so more than a decade or so this fatty streak will take the shape of fibrous plaque and when it takes the shape of fibrous plaque now this is the beginning stage of progressive changes in the endothelium of the arterial wall these changes can ap appear in the coronary arteries by age 30 and it keeps on increasing with age so once endothelial injury has taken place lipoproteins they transport cholesterol and other lipids into the arterial intima then collagen it covers collag collagen or collagen it covers the fatty streak and it will form a fibrous plaque that's why we call them fibrous because collagen covers this fatty streak and it forms a fibrous plaque with a grayish or whitish appearance so from yellow it became grayish or whitish and these plaques can form on one portion of the artery or in a circular fashion involving the involving the entire lumen of the artery and what is the result of all this the the vessel lumen it becomes very narrow and there is reduction in the blood flow to the body tissues the last stage is the complicated lesion stage and here this is the stage when there is a development of the atherosclerotic lesion which is very dangerous now from as the fibrous plaque it keeps growing there is a continued inflammation which can result in plaque instability ulceration and rupture in what now think of this the plaque is becoming unstable ulcerated and it can rupture once the integrity of the arteries inner wall is compromised platelets also start accumulating in large numbers and they will lead to a thrombus that this thrombus can attach to the wall of the artery leading to further narrowing or total blockage of the artery and at this stage this block is known as complicated lesion and what happens on one of those days this any part of this uh block ruptured block thrombus they may it may block the heart circulation completely and patient can have a heart attack so this is how through decades this happens and there is uh, a lot of lifestyle modification which can be done to stop this progress um now so they are actually 
this the coronary disease this is the first slide on etiology and pathophysiology this is the second slide on etiology and pathophysiology and this is third slide on etiology and pathophysiology now c reactive protein it is a protein which is produced by liver and it is a non specific marker of inflammation now it is increased in many patients with cad the level of crp rises when there is a systemic inflammation and chronic elevations of crp are associated with unstable plaques and also the oxidation of low density lipoproteins which is ldl cholesterol which is further contributing to to atherosclerosis so the c reactor protein is a non specific marker of inflammation and it is increased in many patients with cad and uh, the chronic elevation of crp so if you see this protein we rise in uh, getting increased that means there are more chances of having unstable plaques and the there is a more oxidation of ldl cholesterol and which is further contributing to atherosclerosis which is the major cause of acad so crp indicates to the inflammatory uh, response you know the systemic inflammation within the body and it is pointing that there are some unstable plaques within the uh, arterial system okay let's go to the next slide um there is something called collateral circulation now collateral circulation means that a blood has to follow a certain path and it is through the arteries but sometimes some arterial there'll there'll be a new arterial connections within the arterial system and they will start a collateral circulation within the coronary circulation and two factors which will contribute to the growth and extent of these collateral circulation is um the first can be there is a genetic predisposition of the body to develop new blood cells and there is also the presence of chronic ischemia so the two factors which can help in growing of collateral circulation is either the patient has inherited predisposition to develop new blood vessels or the presence of chronic ischemia when a plaque when a plaque it blocks the normal flow of blood through a coronary artery and the resulting ischemia is chronic then there is increased collateral circulation development and when occlusion of the coronary arteries it happens slowly over a long period there is a great chance of adequate collateral circulation developing and the heart muscle may still receive an adequate amount of blood and oxygen however if there is a rapid onset of cad because of maybe some family disposition or some familial there has been high cholesterol in the family or something or coronary spasm there is not much time for collateral development and consequently a diminished blood flow results in a more severe ischemia or infarction so in a nutshell they are saying that with time within the coronary circulation some new arterial connections will develop and it will start its own circulation its own collateral circulation and this can happen because the patient has some genetic disposition to it and the second important cause can be the presence of chronic ischemia because when a plaque occludes the normal flow of blood or it's it blocks the normal flow of blood through a coronary artery and the resulting ischemia is chronic increased collateral circulation starts developing now when the blockage of the coronary artery happens slowly over a long period 
there is a great chance of adequate collateral circulation developing and the heart muscle still getting an adequate amount of blood and oxygen. But if the CAD was very rapid onset, then there is not much time for collateral development. So consequently, a diminished blood flow results in more severe ischemia. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, these are the pictures of three um, blood vessels, like same blood vessels, and they are showing how it can be, um, how it can have collateral circulation. So, um, vessel occlusion with collateral circulation. So, you can see the in A, it is an open functioning coronary artery, and then in B, you can see it's partial coronary artery closure with collateral circulation being established so the arrow points to how the blood flow is going so there is the second artery there is the due to fat deposits it is kind of the blood is having a hard time going so the blood is finding ways from top and bottom so that is collateral circulation there are two kind of circulation happening you know from top and bottom and total coronary artery occlusion with then in third picture you can see there is total coronary artery uh, with coronary sorry third picture you'll see there is total artery occlusion with collateral circulation by passing the uh, the blockage to supply blood to the myocardium so if there was a blockage it is by passing and it's going from left to right to move ahead and reach the heart muscle so this is what it shows in the coronary uh, this is what it shows in the collateral circulation so this is vessel occlusion with collateral circulation okay so first there is open functioning artery then you have partial coronary artery closing with collateral circulation being established and then third is total coronary artery blockage uh, total coronary artery blockage or occ occlusion with collateral circulation bypassing that blockage to supply blood to the heart muscle uh, there's a case study um, there's a 58 year old white male who visits the local health clinic for a physical examination he tells the healthcare provider that he occasionally gets indigestion when he mows the lawn and it goes away in five to ten minutes after he stops and rest so when obtaining a health history what risk factors for coronary artery disease would you ask uh, this patient about and I believe in the fourth semester most of you already know by this now even without reading the book that what kind of looking at his uh, age and you know uh, and what kind of questions we can ask him so you can do brainstorm what risk risk factors uh, this patient can have so it will uh, let's go to the next slide now the risk factors for CAD are non modifiable risk factors age gender ethnicity family history genetic dis predisposition uh, family history is a risk factor for CAD and MI both and most times patients with angina or MI can name a par uh, their parent or sibling who has died of CAD uh, ethnicity African Americans have an earlier onset and more severe CAD than there are CAD counterparts so African Americans they have more CADs than the other races um, now they now they have earlier onset but the incidence of CAD if you look at the race it's among African Americans but if you look at the um, each then the incidence of CAD and MI is highest among white middle-aged men after age 65 the incidence in men and women it becomes equal although cardiovascular diseases causes more deaths in women than men uh, and what is the most special thing about this slide the special thing about the slide is 
these are the factors about which we cannot do anything. These are non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, age, gender, ethnicity, family history, and genetic inheritance. Let's go to the modifiable where we can do something. Modifiable risk factors include elevated serum lipids, elevated blood pressure, um, tobacco use, physical inactivity, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, and uh, high homocysteine level. Um, cholesterol greater than 200 mgtl and so elevated serum lipids and I think I ask you to memorize the chart which is table 35-3 in your book um, um, these are the values which you should always remember uh, so I won't discuss much on this slides because you are already going to read this from your book as I ask you to highlight um, and uh, what the treatment of correcting these modifiable risk factors the guidelines for treating any um, high LDL cholesterol are based on the any person's 10 year risk for having a non-fatal MI or dying from a coronary event and his or her LDL level so they will looking at your these values the patient the doctor can tell you what is your 10 year risk for having a heart attack or not and the, so the doctors will look at your age gender use of tobacco your systolic blood pressure use of any blood pressure drugs total cholesterol HDL cholesterol and then um, um, there is actually a website where you can get a 10 year risk calculator in, gen in general, individuals with no or only one risk factor are considered at low risk for development of CAD. Um, so, memorize these numbers from your book. Um, hypertension, the second major risk factor in CAD is hypertension, which is defined as a blood pressure greater than systolic greater than 140 and diastolic around 90 or if the patient is suffering from chronic kidney disease or diabetes we want their uh, blood pressure at least less than 130 over 80 it should not be greater than 130 over 80 uh, the stress of a high BP increases the rate of atherosclerotic development and this relates to the forcing stress, the shearing stress that causes endothelial injury in the arterial walls. The therapeutic lifestyle changes should begin in, pe should begin in people who already have prehypertension. And what is prehypertension? Prehypertension is BP of 120 to 139 systolic and 80 to 89 diastolic treat stage one or two hypertension with drugs and most of the time they take drugs in combination so you'll have one more than one blood pressure drugs uh, so pre hypertension stage uh, life therapeutic lifestyle changes should begin in people with pre hypertension stage a pre-hypertension stage is a blood pressure of 120 to 139 millimeters of mercury in systolic range and in diastolic it will be from 80 to 89 millimeters of mercury okay let's go to the next slide tobacco use tobacco use is the third major risk factor in CAD is tobacco use the risk of developing CAD is it says is two to six times higher in people who smoke or or use smokeless tobacco than in those who do not and tobacco also reduces your uh, estrogen levels uh, placing the premenopausal women at a greater risk for developing CAD uh, and risk is proportional to the number of cigarettes smoked and that's why you know in the admission questions on the floor you ask you know how many cigarettes you smoke changing to lower nicotine or filtered cigarettes does not affect any risk the risk remains the same now the nicotine which is found in tobacco it 
causes catecholamine that is epinephrine and norepinephrine release. So nicotine in tobacco use will cause catecholamine release and catecholamine release is like that is epinephrine and norepinephrine. These neurohormones will cause an increased heart rate, peripheral vasoconstriction and high PP. These changes will also increase the cardiac workload. Tobacco use is also related to high LDL and low HDL. Carbon monoxide, a byproduct of combustion which is found in tobacco smoke, affects the oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin by reducing the sites available for oxygen transport. Thus, the effect of an increased cardiac workload combined with the oxygen depleting effect of carbon monoxide significantly decreases the oxygen available to the heart muscle. There is also some indication that carbon monoxide is a chemical irritant and it causes injury to the endothelium of the arterial walls. Now if you stop smoking, like if the patient stops smoking, the benefits of smoking cessation are very dramatic and they are almost imagined. CAD mortality rates drop to those of non-smokers within 12 months. However, nicotine is highly addictive and it often calls for intensive interventions to assist people to quit. Uh, Chronic exposure to environmental tobacco or secondhand smoking also increases the risk of CAD. People who live in the same household as the patient should be encouraged to stop smoking. This reinforces the individual's effort and decreases the risk of ongoing exposure to the environmental smoke. Um, now, this includes the pipe and cigar smokers who often do not inhale have an increased risk of CAD similar to those exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. So, yeah, this is um, these are the things, these are the modifiable risk factors and as I said tobacco use will uh, help in progression of CAD. So stopping it has immediate results and patients should also be aware of if they are getting exposed to any secondhand smoke. Let's go to the next slide. Physical inactivity, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. I don't need to tell you about the physical inactivity, obesity, and uh, the diabetes. Um, now, physical activity, they say, is example of health promoting regular physical activity is brisk walking three to four miles per hour for at least 30 minutes, five or, or more times a week. Uh, physically active people will have high HDL levels. Obesity, people who are obese, their mortality rate is higher and it is BMI of greater than 30 kg. So, and a waist circumference equal to or greater than 40 inches for men and greater than or equal to 35 inches for women. So, the more obese, the more is for CAD. Uh, now, diabetes, uh, we have discussed a lot about how incidence of CAD is two to four times greater among persons who have diabetes, even with those persons who have well controlled blood glucose levels. Uh, metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is nothing, it refers to a cluster or group of risk factors for CAD whose underlying pathophysiology may be related to insulin resistance. Uh, these risk factors include obesity as defined by increased waist circumference, hypertension, abnormal serum lipids, and an elevated fasting blood glucose. So these are the reasons, these are some of the reasons for risk factors for CAD, modifiable risk factors for CAD. Psychological states, um, and there was a study which was known as Framingham study and it says that certain behaviors and lifestyles also contribute to the development of CAD. One type of behavior referred to as type A 
includes perfectionism and a hard-working driving personality. The type A person often suppresses anger and hostility and has a sense of time urgency, is impatient and often creates stress and tension. This person may be more prone to MIs than a type B person who is more easygoing, uh, takes upsets, you know, failures in stride, notes their personal limitation, takes time to relax, and is not an overachiever. However, findings from studies regarding these relationships are inconsistent, but they have said that, you know, person who are like kind of pushing themselves too hard, you know, and a perfectionist, they have more chances of getting an MI than a person who knows how to relax and is not an overachiever. Mm, there are also some specific psychological states which are supposed to increase the risk for CAD and these include depression, stress, a lot of hostility and anger and also um, sometimes lack of social support. So depression is one of the main factors depression is one of the factors for developing of cat too um, homocysteine levels high levels of um, homocysteine have been linked to an increased risk for cat and other cardiovascular diseases um, then you have substance abuse substance abuse also contributes towards the risk factors for cat now, two risk factors for coronary heart disease that increase the workload of the fat and increase myocardial oxygen demand are, it's very, uh, it's um, very clear that the two factors which will increase the workload of the heart and increase um, myocardial oxygen demand the answer is uh, B, B as in baby, which is hypertension and cigarette smoking. And elevated blood pressure and cigarette smoking, it causes vasoconstriction and increases the rate of atherosclerosis. And the atherosclerosis increases the workload of the heart and increases myocardial oxygen demand. So two risk factors for coronary artery disease that increase the workload of the heart and increase myocardial oxygen demand are hypertension and cigarette smoking. So the A, C, and D, they are the risk factors, but, but the high blood pressure and cigarette smoking will specifically increase more the workload of heart and will increase myocardial oxygen demand. Which patient is most at risk for developing coronary artery disease? The a hypertensive patient who smokes cigarettes, an overweight patient who uses smokeless tobacco, and a patient who has diabetes and uses methamphetamines, and a sedentary patient who has elevated homocysteine levels. The four, the answer to this is A, a hypertensive patient who smokes cigarettes. The four major modifiable risk factors for coronary artery disease are high serum lipids, hypertension, tobacco use, and physical inactivity. And the other risk factors include diabetes, metabolic syndrome, psychologic states, high levels of homocysteine, and substance abuse. So it says which patient is most at risk. So the patient A you know, the a, a hypertensive patient who smokes cigarettes has double uh, risk factors. So, you know, and it has, um, so this is the answer, A. How can we manage as nurses prevention and early treatment? So, and then we can identify who are at most risk, most risk by asking them questions about their health history, including the family history. Um, uh, also, doing uh, if there is any presence of cardiovascular systems. Um, and you know some problem with their with the heart problems that they're having, anything in their environment, their diet, um, if they are active, their psychosocial history, and their own beliefs about health and illness. Um, 
now some just by asking these questions maybe we'll be able to screen some problems about which the patient doesn't have any idea about um, you know the sometimes uh, just by educating uh, somebody about their type of diet and the exercise or you know maybe a secondhand smoke or something uh, you know we can identify the risk factors early and then and stop the progression of the disease into coronary artery disease so we can educate to patients whom we believe they have many risk factors and they can have um, coronary artery disease. So we can recommend some preventive measures for all persons at risk for CAD. Risk factors such as uh, age, gender, and genetic inheritance cannot be modified, but the risk factors which can be modified are, you know, uh, lifestyle changes. You know, we can educate them what to eat, exercise, uh, get their annual screenings, physicals, blood tests done, and then what are their own personal values of changing their lifestyle so they can be healthy, and then they can set some realistic goals. Yes, it says you have to, uh, you have to run for these many miles but not on the first day you are supposed to run two miles so you know how slowly they can make a set uh, pattern in their life to make some changes so they are out of the risk of coronary artery disease physical fitness program should be designed to improve fitness by following the uh, fit formula it says the fit formula is um, how is the frequency if F stands for frequency so how often you um, exercise and then you know how often the intensity how hard and type you know isotonic and how long with time so fit formula 30 minutes most days plus weight training two days a week so um, this is what is recommended but it has to be you know designed to each patients or individuals you know capacity uh, regular physical activity contributes to weight reduction uh, reduction of greater than 10 percent systolic BP and in some men more than women it increases in HDL cholesterol so everyone should aim for at least 30 minutes of moderate physical activity on most days of the week in addition adding weight training to an exercise program two days a week can help treat metabolic syndrome and improve the muscle strength examples of moderate physical activity can be brisk walking hiking biking swimming and regular physical activity contributes to weight reduction a reduction in systolic BP and in some men more than women as increase in HDL cholesterol now collaborative and nursing management uh, of the SCAD uh, nutritional therapy plays a very major role too uh, along with exercise and low saturated fats and cholesterol should be consumed high complex carbohydrates and fiber and low red meat egg yolks and whole milk and high omega-3 fatty acids food now the national heart lung and blood institute recommends therapeutic lifestyle changes for all people to reduce the risk of care by lowering the ldl cholesterol the low density lipoprotein cholesterol these recommendations emphasize a decrease in saturated fat and cholesterol and an increase in complex carbohydrates and the thing which come in complex carbohydrates are whole grains fruit vegetables and so the national heart lung and blood institute they want people to have less saturated fat and foods and increase in complex carbohydrate foods which are like whole grains fruit vegetables and they also want people to have more fiber in their diet uh, red meat egg yolks and whole milk products are major source of saturated fat and cholesterol and should be reduced or in fact eliminated from their people's diet 
and now if the serum triglyceride is high if the serum triglyceride is high the guidelines recommend reducing or eliminating alcohol intake and simple sugars uh, omega-3 fatty acids are good they reduce the risk associated with cat when they are eaten regularly for individuals without cat the American Heart Association suggests that eating fatty fish twice a week because fatty fish such as salmon and tuna contain two types of omega-3 fatty acids I think it's called EPA and DHA so patients with CAD are encouraged to take EPA and DHA supplements with their diet. The AHA also recommends eating tofu and other forms of soya bean, canola, walnut and flaxseed because these products contain um, a kind of acid which becomes omega-3 fatty, uh, omega fatty acid in your body. So this is the things which also be used for patient education. The question, the notes determines the teaching about implementing dietary changes to decrease the risk of CAD has been effective when the patient says, I should not eat any red meat such as beef, pork or lamb. I should have some type of fish at least three times a week. Most of my fat intake should be from olive oil or the oils and nuts. And then if I reduce the fat in my diet to about 5% of my calories, I will be much healthier. So look at this question. Uh, I just want to drink water. Okay. So the answer is C. Most of my fat intake should be from olive oil, all the oils and nuts. Now, monosaturated fats are found in natural foods such as nuts and avocados. And they are the main component of tea seed oil and olive oil. Canola oil is 57 to 60 percent monosaturated fat. Olive oil is about 75 percent monosaturated fat and tea seed oil is more than 80 percent monosaturated fat. Now other sources include uh, you know grape seed oil, groundnut oil, sesame oil, corn oil. Fat intake it is recommended that fat intake should be 25 should be between 25 and 35 percent of calories and with most of it coming from monosaturated fats and less from saturated fats red meats should be reduced or eliminated from the diet only fatty fish tuna and salmon should be included in the diet because fatty fish is high in omega-3 fatty acids so most of my fat intake should be from olive oil or the oils in nuts is the correct answer because it is monosaturated fat. Oh. Now, the uh, this is the bo the question from the evidence-based NCLEX book. And it's part of the slide. So most of my fat intake should be from olive oil or the oils and not. And it's the correct answer is C, which is um, olive oil. Uh, no, sorry, because it is monosaturated fat. Um, now, with these kind of questions, there is not a perfect rationale. So I don't think I'll be testing you on these kind of questions where, uh, you know, I have to make some kind of rationale to tell you that C is the answer for because for me A and D also A also looks as my good answer so I don't know just um, let's go to the next slide so you won't I won't be testing you on these kind of questions collaborative and nursing management uh, yes we will look at the lipid lowering drug therapy and if diet and exercise is ineffective we will give the patient statins and you have just learned about the work of statins in the cardiac aha drugs handout which i posted on web access we can give them niacin which lowers ldl and triglyceride by inhibiting synthesis it increases hdl and um 
niacin also increases the HDL levels better than many other lipid lowering drugs. The side effect of niacin is the push that the patient may have flushing, pruritus, GI side effects, and orthostatic hypertension. And with the statins, the side effect can be liver damage and myopathy. So these are the two side effects from this from the lipid lowering drugs but these are the medications which we can give to these patients and the person with a serum cholesterol level greater than 200 milligram per dl is at risk for cad and then they should be treated and treatment we usually begin with like with dietary calorie restriction um you know and some activity program and then uh, Then, if this doesn't work, then the doctor might give drugs that will restrict the lipoprotein production. And the statins and niacins are the ones which will most widely used as lipid lowering drugs. Yes. Um, there is um, there is another um, lipid lowering drug therapy. There's another category in this. It is called fibric acid derivatives. Uh, they work by aiding the removal of you know uh, VLDLs and increasing the production of uh, apo lipoproteins uh, they are the most effective drugs for lowering triglycerides and increasing HDLs um, they are something all the call but they also have side effect of GI side effects and that is something called bile acid sequestrants and they increase conversion of cholesterol to bile acids and they also have GI side effects um, let's go back there is another kind first there's another kind um as me my which is zetia it decreases absorption of dietary and biliary cholesterol let's go back i would be more interested in the lipid lowering drug therapy statins and ni niacin okay so now and we can also give some antiplatelet therapy which is uh unless contraindicated if there is a history of GI bleeding a low dose aspirin like M81 milligram is recommended for most people at risk for CAD uh, current low dose recommendations include low dose aspirin for men over 45 years and high risk women that is those with a calculated 10 year care risk of greater than 20 person um, people who are intolerant of aspirin they can go for Plavix so Plavix is another kind of antiplatelet therapy. Uh, gerontologic considerations: there is increased incidence and mortality associated with CAD in older patients, uh, and the leading leading cause of death in older patients. CAD is in older patients. CAD is often a result of the complex interaction of non-modifiable risk factors, which is age, and also the lifelong uh, lifelong non-compliance to the factors which could have been modified like maybe tobacco use or physical inactivity or obesity uh, now strategies to reduce risk and treat CAD are effective in this group too so if they get proper support their life can be prolonged um, we should treat their hypertension and uh, uh, aggressive treatment of their high BP and high lipidemia. So high hyperlipidemia will stabilize the plaques in the coronary arteries of older patients and the cessation of tobacco we use will help in decreasing the risk for CAD uh, not even for not only for older patients but for any kind of uh, you, any kind of individual so this is the gerontological concentrations for CAT now we need to educate and educate these patients so it is necessary to modify guidelines for physical activities they will have longer warm-ups longer periods of low level activity longer rest periods we will tell them they should avoid extremes of temperature uh, heat intolerance in the older adult results from a decreased ability to sweat 
efficiently teach the patient to avoid physical activity in extremes of temperature and to maintain a moderate pace. The older adult should exercise a minimum of 30 minutes on most days of the week as capable of. Um, they should be adopting a healthy lifestyle which can increase the quality of life and reduce the risk of CAD and other uh, uh, fatal cardiac events. Um, most likely they will change when they have been has hospitalized or when they are showing some symptoms like chest pain or something. Uh, you uh, as a nurse you should assess the old patient for if their readiness to change you know are they going to change their lifestyle once they have been hospitalized or they had been through this chest pain and then help the patient to select the lifestyle change which they are capable of and which will help in reduction of their risk for CAD so MP's health history and physical examination reveals the following risk factors for CAD and uh, family history of CAD, smokes one pack of cigarettes a day, sedentary lifestyle, high fat diet, blood pressure 152 over 94, BMI 30.2. And so this based on these factors patient has chronic stable angina and uh, and based on the presence of these factors the MP complained about indigestion associated with activity so what he was thinking was the indigestion which was associated with activity was actually the chronic stable angina it was persistent chest pain so um, the clinical manifestation of CAD is the very famous word called angina um, and uh, it is an increased demand for oxygen or a, it is an increased demand for oxygen or it is a decreased supply of oxygen uh, which can the angina can lead to MI um, it's a progressive disease and angina is equals to risk uh, is, is equal to reversible ischemia uh, so on the cellular level the myocardium it becomes hypoxic within the first 10 seconds of coronary occlusion uh, and the primary reason for in um, the why um, it becomes hypoxic is because there is in insufficient blood flow due to narrowing of coronary arteries by atherosclerosis so and it occurs when the arteries are blocked 75 percent or more hypoxic within 10 seconds of inclusion and they are uh, with in ischemic conditions cardiac cells are viable for approximately 20 min minutes so if there is an ischemic condition not uh, oxygen reaching the heart muscle the cardiac cells are viable for approximately 20 minutes and with restoration of blood flow aerobic metabolism resumes and the heart contractility is restored and cellular repair can begin so the, this is the window of time which we have when we can help this patient uh, so angina or chest pain is a clinical manifestation of reversible MI uh, myocardial cells are deprived of oxygen and glucose glucose which are needed for aerobic metabolism and contractility and aerobic metabolism begins and lactic acid accumulates and lactic acid is irritates the nerve fibers and which leads to the pain in cardiac nerves so that's why patient has chest pain and lactic acid um, while irritating the myocardial nerve fibers it also transmits a pain message to the cardiac nerves and upper thoracic posterior nerve roots and this that's why uh, this accounts for referred pain referred cardiac pain to the shoulders neck lower jaw and arms so that's why we educate the patient you know uh, or you if you have a 
pain which is radiating to your jaw lower jaw arm shoulder neck you know call 911 because you're having uh, you know there's a window of opportunity for us to save uh, when questioned some patients may deny feeling pain but will describe a pressure or ache in the chest it's in a very unpleasant feeling often described as a squeezing heavy choking or suffocating sensation angina is rarely sharp or stabbing and it usually does not change with position or breathing so if the patient changes their position it won't stop and it's not like sharp pain it's really sharp or stabbing um many people in angina will complain of indigestion or a burning sensation in their epigastric region although most of the pain experienced by people with angina appears uh, substernally the sensation may occur in the neck or may radiate to various locations including the jaw and shoulders and down the arms often people will complain of pain between the shoulder blades and will dismiss it as not being heart related so there in the other areas neck jaw back they they are having a referred pain because of the chest pain because of the angina uh, so this is the slide which shows you know where the pain can radiate to so there is a mid sternum left shoulder and down both arms and there's going to neck and arms and then the substernal is radiating to neck and jaw and then the substernal pain is radiating down left arm there is an epigastric region uh, pain radiating to neck jaw and arms and then there is between the shoulder blades which is intrascapular so this is all um, pain Um, regions where the pain can be noticed during the angina um there is something called chronic stable angina which was happening with the patients is refers to the which was happening to a patient mp and which refers to chest pain that occurs intermittently over a long period with the same pattern of onset duration and intensity of symptoms sorry so they have they occur over a long period with the same pattern of onset duration and intensity of symptoms and they go up to 5 to 15 minute duration and uh, if you put the ecg lead on this patient you can see st segment depression and or t wave inversion and that can be controlled with drugs and that's what i think uh, you have also learned in your dysrhythmia lab and dysrhythmia lecture with uh, ms tracy last week um so let's go to the next slide uh chronic stable in china and there are types of angina and there is this is silent ischemia it refers to ischemia that occurs in the absence of any subjective symptoms and it can be associated with diabetic neuropathy patients with diabetes have an increased prevalence of silent ischemia this is most likely due to diabetic neuropathy affecting the nerves that innervate the cardiovascular system because they have neuropathy they are not able to feel that subjective symptoms with other patients can who don't have diabetes uh, and di- silent ischemia is documented by ecg changes so when you put these patients on leave with leads you can see the same uh, changes as happening with angina with the other patients in these patients too uh nocturnal angina it only happens in night but not necessarily when the person is in the um uh, um recumbent position or during sleep so it could occurs only at night angina decubitus is chest pain that occurs only while lying down and is relieved by standing or sitting uh prince metals angina or variant angina it occurs at rest usually in response to spasms of major coronary artery it is seen with a patient with a history of migraine headaches and raynaud's phenomena spasm may occur in the absence of cad2 uh prince metal angina often occurs at rest usually in response to spasm of major coronary artery may occur with or without cad 
and is not usually precipitated by increased physical demand. Strong contraction of smooth muscle in the coronary artery results from increased intracellular calcium too. And the, some the coronary spasms, which may lead to this, they might include, um, it might happen because there have been increased oxygen demand on the heart muscle and increased level of certain substances have been in the body example tobacco use alcohol or amphetamines when the coronary spasm happens the patient experiences angina and uh, uh, st segment elevation on scg on ecg microvascular angina in microvascular angina chest pain occurs in the absence of significant coronary atherosclerosis or coronary spasm myocardial ischemia associated with abnormalities of the coronary microcirculation coronary microvascular disease it affects the small distal coronary arteries if uh, I might test you on silent ischemia and the chronic stable in China. So these are good to know. Sorry, the slide, uh, slide 36. Nocturnal angina, angina decubitus is good to know. And Prince Metal is angina is good to know. But I won't be testing you on this. And then this is also good to know, but I won't be testing you on this. And microvascular angina is good to know, but I won't be testing you on this. Uh, while awaiting diagnostic testing for MP, what drug would you expect the healthcare provider to prescribe for MP to use if he develops the indigestion pain the next time he moves along? Sublingual nitroglycerine. Now, the thing with sublingual nitroglycerine is if you know that drill, you know, every uh, five minutes or what, how many times you can have, three times you can have this nitroglycerine. Now, in one thing two things you need to remember about nitroglycerin whenever you're taking the second one third one in between it's important as the nurse for you to take his vital signs his blood pressure and then you can, then only you can give the second one and another thing is if after taking all these three nitroglycerins the, there is no effect then the what should patient do patient should call 911 should call for help then you really need to go to ER The goal of the chronic stable angina is to decrease the oxygen demand in the body and in, or increase the is to aim is to decrease oxygen demand or increase oxygen supply. And the short acting nitrates are the first line of therapy for the treatment of angina. Nitrates produce the principal effects by by dilating the peripheral blood vessels by dilating coronary arteries and collateral um, coronary arteries and collateral vessels so they are very helpful in uh, treatment of angina the nitrates and the nitrate the the nitroglycerin is given sublingually or by translingual spray and will usually relieve pain in about three minutes and has a duration of approximately 30 to 60 minutes. The recommended dose for patients for whom nitroglycerin has been prescribed is one tablet taken sublingually or, uh, or one metered spray for symptoms of angina. If symptoms are unchanged or worse after five minutes, the patient should contact the emergency medical services before taking additional uh, nitroglycerin. If symptoms are significantly improved by one dose of nitroglycerin, instruct the patient or the caregiver to repeat nitroglycerin every five minutes for a maximum of three doses and contact EMS if symptoms have not resolved completely. Instruct the patient in the proper use of nitroglycerin it should be easily accessible to the patient. The patient should store the tablet away from light and heat sources, including the body heat to protect from degradation. 
tablets are packed in light resistance bottles with metal caps. Once opened, the tablets tend to lose to protect from degradation. Once opened, the tablets tend to lose their potency and should be replaced every six months. Tell the patient to place a nitroglycerin tablet under the, under the tongue and allow it to dissolve. If using the spray, it should be directed on or under the tongue, not inhaled. Nitroglycerin should you cause a tingling sensation when administered. Otherwise, it may be outdated. So there are some instructions about nitroglycerin, some patient teaching about this nitroglycerin, which is very important. Okay. I will post a small, a very, uh, like a, like a, like a seven bullet point note on the web access on um, how the treatment of chronic stable angina is done through the first line therapy of nitrates and you know what, what how the nitrates help and how patient education should be done about nitroglycerin tablets or spray so you can expect that on the web access soon uh, long acting acting nitrates they reduce angina incidence main side effects are head, headache and orthostatic hypertension and methods of administration are oral nitroglycerin and there are also transdermal control release tablets what diagnostic testing would you expect the healthcare provider to order for NMP so what test we can order for this patient so uh, refer your book so what test the patient the doctor might order for this patient um, the drugs which he can have uh, so they can take ACE inhibitors b adrenergic blockers calcium channel blockers and there is something called sodium current inhibitors uh, Ranexa it is used to treat chronic angina in those patients who have not achieved adequate response with other anti-anginals. Because uh, Renexa prolongs the QT interval, patients with long QT interval or taking QT prolonging drugs. Uh, example, Prozac should not use it. So if somebody is using a Prozac, Prozac they should not use Renexa. And common side effects of Renexa can be nausea, constipation, and generalized weakness. Uh, we'll do the diagnostic test. So these are the, some of the diagnostic uh, tests. Uh, calcium score, score screening, heart scan. It locates calcium deposits in atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries. So calcium score, screening, heart scan actually test the calcium deposits within the plaque in the arterial wall. Um, MP's chest, so when the tests were done, the MP's chest x-ray and ECG results were all within normal limits. And his cholesterol and triglycerides levels were also elevated. Uh, he developed chest pain and T-segment depression during exercise stress tests. And what additional testing would you expect MP to undergo at this point? The doctor might think of doing a cardiac catheterization. Um, cardiac catheterization or coronary angiography it visualizes the blockage and it's open it also um, if a coronary blockage is amenable to an intervention then uh, coronary revascularization is done with a PTCA PCTA per, you know percutaneous coronary intervention and I talked about this in the in the other e lecture video about the you know the balloon angioplasty and how the stent is placed uh, placement of coronary artery stent this is a very clear picture a stent is an expandable mesh like structure designed to keep the vessel open by compressing the arterial wall because stents are thrombogenic anticoagulants are used during this procedure to help prevent the abrupt closure of the stents so the patient doctor can use heparin etc uh, after this procedure the patient is treated with dual anti agents 
nose so until the intimal lining can grow over the stent and can provide a smooth vascular surface many stents are 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 coated with drug so they can prevent the overgrowth of new intima the most serious complication from stent placements are abrupt closure and vascular injury so now mb undergoes a cardiac catheterization and 90% occlusion of his right coronary artery is discovered he got gets the balloon angioplasty and stent placement discharge teaching related to cad and lifestyle changes for mp what can you give him just re- brainstorm some ideas what discharge discharge teaching you want to give to this patient and what follow up teaching you can give this patient so this brings me to the end of uh, uh, all e lectures in the heart series okay thank you uh,